I want the broken. I want the people who were high last night. I want the people who were having sex last night. I want the people who were stripping last night. I want the people who were smoking weed last night. I want those people in this place because this is where change happens. This is where hope happens. This is where life is given. And this isn't a ticket to go do that. You're like, oh, pastor, that's me. Woo, I'm in the right place. No, I'm not, I'm not glorifying that. How many of you guys struggle with memory? Anybody here wrestle with memory? And keep your hands up, right? Keep your hands up. That's good. I, I like the honesty. Now, for, for all of those, go ahead and put them down. Um, for all of those who forget to text back, anybody ever respond to a text in their mind but never get back to it? All right, that's me. That's Kyra for sure. Her whole phone. She's, people are just like, they think she ghosted, but honestly, she's just on to, to something else. Um, we as human beings have the proclivity to forget so easily. We, we are constantly forgetting things. In the Bible, over and over, the Lord, especially in the Old Testament, would say, remember, or remember, bring to memory, don't forget. Let me remind you, stay alert, be awake, be aware, remember, remember, remember. Um, research actually talks about this thing called the rule of seven. Has anybody heard of the rule of seven? I'm gonna put you guys on today. So the rule of seven says that, uh, most people need to hear a message between five to seven times before they actually remember it. And, and in the case of husbands and children, it's more like a rule of 17. Most of us need to be told 17 times before we actually remember to put the toilet seat down or to pick our clothes up off of the floor or to not eat sugar before dinner. Um, the rule of seven, the rule of seven. So what research shows is that we need to hear things in order for them to go from our short term to our long term memory. And so what I want to do is I want to share a refresher. Who is here on our two year anniversary? Was anybody here in October, our two year anniversary? So when we had our two-year anniversary, I shared what our mission is. I shared what our vision is. And as I was preparing this message, even though I prepared it last week, I was going to just preach it. And God was like, you know what? You need to remind them of why we're here. Like, what are we doing as a church? If I asked you guys, what is our mission statement? Show of hands, who could tell me right now? Our one-line mission statement. And I know a lot of our volunteers and people, like, they know because I hammer it in our huddles. But our mission is simple. It's to lead the lost to the light. I mean, I'd woo too. That was pretty dang good. That's, that, that should be on a t-shirt. To lead the lost to the light. You don't gotta clap. I'm just saying, that's our mission statement. To lead the lost to the light. The lost to the light. Now, I wanna share with you the seven dreams and visions of RCC. I'm gonna share with you the foundational verse, and then we're gonna break into the Bible. We're gonna get into the scripture. We're gonna hammer 17 different verses of scripture. So for my Bible purists who are like, preach the word, we're going to, but I need to remind you because you guys already forgot what our mission was. Can anybody now restate what the mission is? Some of you already forgot. Yeah, yeah, it's not a trick question. To lead the lost to the light. And the foundational scripture that that's built on is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 is the foundational scripture on why we are called Royal City Church. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Am I talking to anybody who's been called out of darkness? Have I, am I talking to anybody who's been saved, who's been through some things, who's been rescued by the power of God, by the power of Jesus? The transformational blood of Jesus Christ changed my life. And now every breath that I breathe is a breath breathed to point people to that Savior. I want those who are lost to find a place that's comfortable here so that they can be introduced to the light that changed my life. Amen? That is our mission. That is why we're doing church. Seven dreams and visions of RCC. The first one is to be a lighthouse to the lost, broken, hurting, and abandoned. A lot of people have been church hurt. A lot of people have struggled inside the walls of a church building, but I want to remind you that the church didn't hurt you, people did. God didn't hurt you, people did. The organization of church probably hurt you, not the organism, the body, which is alive and well today. That's not what hurts you. Usually, a person who poorly misrepresented Jesus is what hurts you. 
And so what we want to do is create a community and an environment where we reach the lost, the broken, the hurting, and the abandoned. The second dream and vision of why we are here. And again, this is a reminder. I'm going to be going over these quarterly once every couple of months to remind you guys until you get this down into your innermost being and you realize that that is the DNA of what Royal City Church is about. It is to be a sanctuary and safe haven for discarded sinners. The church is a place for the lost. This is not a place for the righteous, for the holier than thou, for those who have it all figured out. I want the broken. I want the people who were high last night. I want the people who were having sex last night. I want the people who were stripping last night. I want the people who were smoking weed last night. I want those people in this place because this is where change happens. This is where hope happens. This is where life is given. And this isn't a ticket to go do that. You're like, oh, pastor, that's me. Woo, I'm in the right place. No, I'm not, I'm not glorifying that. But what I'm saying is I want to create a place where we're not judging you because you smell like that sticky icky. Right? We're not going to judge you because you've been puffing loud. Like That's not what it is. Is We want to create a safe place where you feel loved, heard, and welcomed because we can do what? Lead the lost to the light. And when you take the lost to the light, the light does the changing, not me. The third one is to establish a community outreach program for low-income families. That's one of the things that we're doing. We love the Alexandria House. We love Love Movement. We work with Bear Truth. We're working with community organizations because, look, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm a WIC baby. I'm an EBT baby. I was doing food stamps when food stamps were still paper. I was taking the $5 food stamp down and buying a 25-cent pack of gum so I could take the change back to my mom so she could buy drugs. So I know what it is to be a low income individual. So what we're trying to do is create outreach programs for this community to make an impact in people's lives. The church should be doing that. The fourth one is create disciples that make a difference through our small groups, Bible studies, and programs. We harp on small groups, our Bible studies, and our programs. The reason why we have them, you guys, church is more than just what happens on Sunday. The fact that you guys are here, you can muster up the strength to get yourselves here. I applaud that. And I think that's amazing. But true life change happens outside of what we do in this place. It happens in our small groups. It happens in our Bible studies. It happens at our outreaches. When we engage and interact with one another outside of just here. Who's got problems on Mondays? I mean, Monday, most all of us, right? Like, if we're being honest, most all of us. Like, you come here Sunday, it's good. We clap, we scream, we yell Jesus. We, you know, we, we have a good time. But then we go out and we're right back to our old ways. But in small groups, when we're engaging in smaller, closer, intimate groups is where change happens. The fifth vision and dream of Royal City Church is to plant other churches around the world and send out missionaries to preach the gospel. Uh, we want to be Royal City Church Uganda. We want to be Royal City Church Atlanta. We want to be Royal City Church around the world. We want to be Royal City Church Culver City. Like we want to be Royal City Church and we want to plant churches around the world. We want to make a global impact. That's one of the dreams that we have. But it starts here. The sixth one is to launch a next gen program that reaches the youth of Inglewood. Do I got anybody who grew up fatherless? Anybody grew up without a dad? Fatherless is, fatherlessness is one of the greatest epidemics that we have in our society today. People who are fatherless have a higher rate of hurting others, of being incarcerated, being addicted to drugs, uh, creating the same problems, leaving kids fatherless as well, uh, hurting women. It's tough. And it starts with our youth. We need men to rise up. We need men to stand up. We need men to step up to the plate and to help lead some of these next generation programs that reaches the youth of Inglewood. It starts right here. I'm not running for office, by the way. This isn't like a, a I'm not like this isn't a speech because I want you guys to vote for me. This is what this church is doing. And if this isn't for you, I understand. If you want a church that just comes up here and gives you a motivational speech and tickles your ears and makes you feel good and lets you go out until next Sunday so they can pass the hat around, we might not be that for you. But what we want to do is we want to walk out what it is that we're talking about. We want to make a difference, right? So vote for me. <laughs> That's crazy. It just flows so well. The last one, we, and this is a crazy dream, right? And I just met my man, JC. He, he, he quoted, he said, look, man, it's only crazy until it happens. 
But what I want to do is I want to own a permanent building here in Inglewood with land. And on that land, I want to develop affordable housing, Christian school, transition homes, and after school programs. And I believe that we can do that. I believe that with you all, we can do that. Where's Christian at? My boy, Christian Robbins. Okay, he's got a shirt on from our anniversary that says, we the church. And I want to remind you guys that it is we the church. This isn't Pastor Andrew's church. My vision is that Royal City Church will go on long after I breathe my last breath. I am merely stewarding it. This is our church. This is your church. This is, this is our church. And so I need you to be a part of what we are doing because you're here not by coincidence. You have been called for a time such as this to make an impact in the seat that you're sitting in. The rule of seven, the law of seven. I've, I've preached this before. How many of you, is this the first time that you've heard this, right? And, and for the first time that you heard it, how many of you are like, oh, I remember that, right? Like you've already forgotten. We do this by number one, preaching the gospel. The gospel has the power to change. The gospel has the power to change to save, to transform. So what we do is we come to the gospel and we preach that. That's number one. Number two is by building disciples and community in our small groups. You are going to hear a lot about small groups because that is where change happens. If you're not in one, get in one. If one's not in your city, start one. Talk to me and we'll start one in your house and we'll come through and you got to provide good food. Okay. And I'm judging it. The third one, this is on me. I need to prepare our church to engage their oikos. Anybody know what an oikos is? And it's not just a really good Greek yogurt, right? That's a brand, but oikos, the actual word oikos means house or household. How do you engage your house or your household? Another way to look at that word is your sphere of influence. The people where you work, where you eat, where you play, where you spend your time. How do you engage the people in your oikos or your sphere of influence? I need to prepare you guys on how to engage with them to get them connected so that we can start working in their lives. So God can start working in their lives. We take the lost to where? Light. To the light. Not a trick question. Okay. That's the third time I've said it. I'm gonna, a couple more times. You guys will get it. We're going to take the lost to the light. Woo, that's our mission. And once they get to the light, Jesus starts doing what Jesus does. Am I talking to anybody who's been redeemed by Jesus? Has anybody's life been changed by Jesus? Was anybody ever lost and has come to the light? That's the people that I'm talking to because those are my people. And then the last one is by creating opportunities to give back and serve the community. Look, I don't think we gave enough credit where credit's due. Can we give an applause to the Sea Salt Fish Grill? Can we give an applause for my man, David? Because David's, David's business needs Keith Lee. If you know what I'm talking about. Anybody know Keith Lee? Does anybody follow Keith Lee on TikTok? We got a couple of them. A few others are like, I don't know who this Keith Lee is, but he is a food critic who goes to small businesses. And if he goes and says the food is good, there's lines around the door. Okay. A lot around the door, around the corner. Okay. Out the door and around the corner. Um, David is not in a place where he can just give stuff away, especially 10%. But he's opened his doors and said, hey, look, I care about people. If you know David, you know that David cares about people. I care about people. I care about the Alexandria house. And I'm willing between these hours to give 10% of everything we make back to somebody. That takes selflessness. That takes generosity. And so after church, I would love to see you guys there. That is an opportunity to give back and to serve the community. Amen. Amen. Let's go break bread together. Listen, the sermon that I'm about to preach because that wasn't the sermon. That was just the reminder. Can you guys say reminder with me? Reminder. That was just the reminder, the law of seven, the rule of seven. You got to hear something seven times before it actually sticks. We're going to talk about life in Christ. So I want to start in Colossians chapter three, verse one. Has anybody heard of the passion translation? of the Bible, the Passion Translation, okay? Um, what many people don't know is that it's less of a translation and more of a paraphrase. Um, many of the big Bible uh, representatives like Gateway, uh, they've, they've rejected it because it was only written by one man. It didn't go through uh, scholarly review like many of the other translations of the Bible. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's NIV, the New King James Version, the ESV, the English Standard Version. There's different versions. And in order for a Bible to get like the stamp of approval, it goes through a committee and a process of being approved to make sure that it holds tight and stands firm when it comes to 
the word of God. And so the passion translation, I would prefer to call it a passion paraphrase. I still love it. I enjoy it. I always double check it with what the word says, however. Um, so what we're going to do is I want to do this compare and contrast. Do I got any Bible people out there who love the word of God? Anybody out there love the word of God? Or maybe, maybe you're learning to love it, right? Maybe you're learning to love it. I'm a, you're going to learn today because I'm going to teach you something a little bit about this word. We're going to walk ourselves through uh, Colossians chapter 3. Um, in the New King James Version, it says this. Verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting, sitting at the right hand of God. But what the Passion Translation or the paraphrase says, it says Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. You guys, this is good news, your resurrection too. It's not just Jesus's. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Our minds are to be set on him. Verse two, put that up there, please. It says this, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Passion translation, yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. How many people out there are distracted? How many of you are already thinking about where you're eating lunch today? You're already hungry. You got the stomach rumbling. It's the sea salt fish grill. I'm going to tell you guys that right now. So let me just take that distraction away from you. But how many of you are easily distracted? Well, we have that squirrel mentality. Like in the day and age that we live in so with social media, people's attention spans are almost non-existent. 15 seconds, we're scrolling, 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 scrolling. You might watch, ah, that's too long. Anybody ever scrolled when something's good, but it's too long? And you're like, ah, my attention span. Yeah, what? Right. Some of you are already doing that with my message right now. You went verse one, verse two, ah, and you're already gone. Bring it back. Like, give me your attention. Holy Spirit, give them an attention span that's larger than a fleas. That would be ideal. But hey, he says, look, you're, you're so distracted. Set your mind on things above and not the things on this earth. What are the things of this earth that are a distraction? Success, fame, influence, relationship a lot of the time. What are the things that are constantly pulling at us? What are the things that are constantly grabbing at us? It says to set your mind on things above. This wasn't a part of what I was going to do, but Philippians chapter 4 Verse eight says this, this isn't going to be on the screen because I just thought of this. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, and of virtue or praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So the Bible is telling us that we need to set our mind on things that are good and righteous and pure and holy. I'll give you an example, all right? You're lifting weights in the mirror. Okay. I don't know why you guys are laughing. Nobody lifts weights in the mirror anymore. That's super weird. Okay. Maybe you're not in the mirror. Um, let me give me a better example there. What are you doing? You're doing Pilates. All right. You're doing Pilates. Maybe the guys can, you know, you're doing Pilates and you're, you're stretching and maybe a super good looking gal comes right in front of you and decides to do straight leg deadlifts in yoga pants. Somebody, I'm speaking to somebody. <laughs> somebody said, hey, Amen. look, but I'm going to help you right now. We're going to take our mind off of these earthly things that are leading us astray. And we're going to place our mind on things that are pure and noble and holy and of good report. You might need to stop your Pilates session and take an about face and walk out of that situation. What is good and what is pure? You know what? That is my sister in Christ. She might not know it. She might not be dressed like it. She might not be positioned like it. But you know what? That is my sister in Christ. That is God's daughter. That is his child. And my thoughts are not pure. They're not holy. They're not righteous. They're not good report. They do not check the boxes. I'm out of here. And we should be running our thoughts, our actions, our behaviors through this checklist we should be moving in a way that is changing our lives by setting our mind on things above. Verse three, it says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life 
And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. So many people are looking for the purpose of their life. The purpose of your life is not for you to win. It's not for you to succeed. It's not for you to have the most money in your account. It's not for you to travel and see the most places around this world. Now, none of those things are bad or evil. We want you to have money in your account. I personally like to travel. I'm not demonizing any of those things, but when you cut ties with the life that died with Jesus and you grab a hold of the life that was resurrected with him, that's when you have true life. That's when you have real life. That's when you have purpose. Verse four, when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed for you are now one with him in his glory. I hold on to the day, right? I, I, I said, we're not afraid of the earthquake. We're not afraid of the eclipse. Why? Because my mind is set on heavenly things, things of eternity. I'm, I'm not worried about tomorrow because today has enough worry in and of itself. My joy and my hope and my peace don't come in whether or not I get the next uh, next check. It's not in whether or not I get the next opportunity or whether or not I'm here or there. My hope and my faith and my trust is in the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride and I am going to be a part of that. That is where my hope is. That is where my trust is. That is what drives me every single day. And my prayer is that it drives you as well, that it wakes you up and you realize, hey, I am cutting ties with this life because my purpose isn't in this life. It's in him. Amen. Amen. I'm passionate about this because I'm, I'm living this. I'm in the middle of it. And I'm not here trying to sell you guys on anything. Jesus changed my life. And I know that he's changed a lot of yours as well. And I want you guys to experience that same freedom and that same light feeling like it's, it's this weightlessness. And it doesn't mean that we don't got stuff. We still, still have bad days, still go through tough times, still struggle, still wrestle with different things. They're all there. They're all present, but I'm holding on to Jesus and him returning. That's where my hope is. That's where my joy is. Do you guys understand the, the difference between happiness and joy? Happiness comes and goes. You give me a cupcake on a Sunday. That's happiness, baby. I'm, I'm through the roof. I'm happy. I say Sunday because that's like my cheat day. I eat whatever I want on Sunday. So happiness, you know what I mean? So happiness, I'm like through the roof, but guess what happens after that high on Monday? not so happy and neither is the restroom. I don't feel good because I ate too much. Happiness comes and goes. It ebbs and flows based on your circumstances. Joy is something that is with you. It's with you forever. It doesn't come. It doesn't go. It doesn't waver. You have a joy because you know who Jesus is. He is our rock. He is our savior. He is immutable. Our joy doesn't come and go based on our circumstances. Verse five, therefore, let's see the King James sound, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I love what it says here. Live as one who has died to every form of sexual sin and impurity. Live as one who has died to the desires for forbidden things, including the desire for wealth, which is the essence of idol worship. Because we have died with Christ and have been resurrected, those things that once held us no longer do. You are no longer bound to lust. You're no longer bound to sexual perversion. You're no longer bound to the love of money. You might wrestle with those things and you think that they have control, but that tells me that you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus. You are now indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You are free and free indeed. They have been cut. The ties have been cut. And if you believe anything else but the truth, then you're believing a lie. You're not living in the fullness of who you are in Christ Jesus. Live as one who has died. Why? Because you have. You're a new creation. The Bible says that you are a new creation and the power in you, thank you, and the power in you is greater than the power in this world. Verse six, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Verse seven, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. We're going to keep going. Verse eight, give me eight on the screen. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. That's how you once behaved. 
characterized by your evil deeds, but now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and for all. Your anger, your fits of rage, all forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speech and lying, lay aside your old Adam self with its masquerade and disguise. This is calling you higher. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole group of Christians and, and look, I'm not perfect, but they got shirts that say, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. That's not something to boast in. And I'm not saying I'm above that. If you play basketball with you, you know I might cuss a little. And I'm not saying that proud. I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of that fact. I get competitive. I get in the moment. Don heard me at our men's fellowship. Like, <laughs> imagine inviting men out to your men's fellowship to play basketball. And I'm saying, get that ass out of here. And I'm blocking shots. And I'm sweating and jumping around like, this is your pastor? And it's like... <laughs> Does he know Jesus? And you're like, I swear I do. I'm not bragging on that. But these are the things that we got to cut ties with. That's something that I'm working on. I stopped playing basketball because I couldn't watch my, I needed, I needed a break. I was like, you know what? I can't be out there because I'm being a false witness. I, I was playing a basketball game and I got fouled and I said the F word. And after the game, one of the guys sit on the sideline goes, aren't you that pastor on Instagram? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's, that's me. That's me. And he said that he was inspired by me. And I'm like, how? I don't know how that you would be inspired by me, a broken individual, saying things that I shouldn't. We need to cut ties because the ties have been cut once and for all when Jesus died and rose again. Amen? Amen. Let's keep getting through this word. Verse 10. You've put on the new man is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of who, uh, him who created him. For you have acquired new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. You are continually being renewed. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank God for the process of sanctification. Thank God for his patience. Thank God that he is kind and merciful and loving and slow to anger. Thank God. DeMarla at the beginning was talking about how he sees us as his children, as his children. And I'm so grateful for that illustration because I have kids and, and I love my kids. My oldest son is a menace to society. He's just like I was when I was a kid. He's a good kid, don't get me wrong, but he is, he, he's like me, he's hard headed. He's gotta learn everything the hard way and tests my patience regularly. My middle son, great kid. Uh, he actually got offered a basketball scholarship yesterday, which I was really excited about. Uh, the first of many to come. Um, it's been really good. My youngest son is probably the sweetest kid I've ever met. He has a heart of gold. And if it wasn't for his older brothers, he wouldn't be as bad as he was. They're just bad influences. You know how, you know how the youngest sibling, they get that from the older. Um, they exposed him to a lot of stuff. Not bad stuff, but definitely cuss words and things he shouldn't be doing. And then I have my daughter. <sighs> um, who is perfect and can't do anything wrong at this point. But... I think of regularly as I'm holding her in my arms, the love that I have for that little baby. I love her. She cries, I'm patient. She goes to the bathroom up the front and the back, I'm patient, right? If she wants something, I'm patient. I love her, I care for her, I'm gonna change her, I'm gonna take care of her, I'm gonna provide every need, I'm gonna give her everything that she needs and probably some of the things that she wants if I'm being honest um, and whatever she asks for but I care, I love her. And in the same way, our heavenly father loves us just like that and more. He loves us just like that and then some. He wants what's best for you, even when you don't see or know what's best for you. That job that you're praying for, that relationship that you're trying to hold on to, that opportunity that you think was going to change your life, God wants what's best for you even when you don't even know it. Thank God for his patience. Thank God for the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf so that God would embrace us like his children. I'm grateful for that love. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I love how the paraphrase puts this. In this new creation life, and for those of you who have put their faith in Jesus, in this life, your nationality makes no difference, nor your ethnicity or your education 
or your economic status. They matter nothing. Because in Christ Jesus, that means everything. It is Christ Jesus that means everything. And he lives in every one of us. It's no longer about where we were or where we came from. It's about who we are. It's about who you are. The amount of money in your bank account doesn't get you a better seat in the theater. The, the lack of money in your bank account doesn't put you up in the nosebleeds. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter because we are all together in one, as one, and for one. Verse 12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, I love this. You are always and dearly loved by God. So robe yourself with virtues. I love this paraphrase because it's not threatening you. God's not saying that you have to do this. I want you to understand one thing. God doesn't try to change your behavior because he doesn't want you to have fun. He's not trying to stop you from having premarital sex because he doesn't want you to have sex. He's not trying to get you to do these things because he's trying to stop you from living your best life. The things that God wants you to do is for your best. It's because he's trying to protect you. He's trying to keep you from the hurt. Maybe if you would have listened to God and didn't get into that relationship, you wouldn't be dealing with the betrayal and the trust issues and the heartbreak and all of the baggage that comes from that traumatic experience that he tried to protect you from. God is trying to protect us and he's giving us instruction on how to live because he wants what's best for us. When we understand that, we can read this. So robe yourself with virtues of God because you have been divinely chosen to be holy. Be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. That's one thing that sometimes the church lacks is mercy and understanding each other because we don't have the same background, because we didn't come from the same place, because we don't share ex life experiences. Understand others and be compassionate, showing kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. We, it says to be unoffendable, but the church is one of the most offended groups of people that I've ever met. Keeping track of all the wrongs done to one another, stepping on each other's toes, gossiping, being short with one another. We have got to do a better job. This first part of Colossians chapter three is, I don't want to say an indictment, but it's pointing out how we once were right now. This is how we should be living. So the next verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Here, it says, tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith. We got to do a better job of tolerating each other, loving each other, being compassionate. It says, forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. So many of us are holding on to unforgiveness. So many of us refuse to let go of the wrongs that were done to us at the hands of others. And I know that you're going to say, well, Pastor Andrew, you don't know what it was like. They did this. They did that. They hurt me. They lied to me. They cheated. They touched me wrong. They did these things. I understand that there are horrible and terrible and atrocious things that happen to each and every one of us, myself included. But if Jesus can forgive us for everything we've done, then we should be generous enough to do the same to those who have done that to us. And let me be very clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you need to back, jump back into a relationship with somebody who will hurt you or abused you. That's not what I'm saying. But you can love and forgive somebody from a distance with healthy boundaries without reconciliation of that relationship. What I'm talking about is the position and the posture of your heart. Some of you are making decisions and choices based on past hurt, past experiences that you haven't grown to forgive, and you're not allowing yourself to enter into the relationships that God has called you to be because you're making choices and decisions off of past trauma. Mmm, y'all said mmm. <laughs> so if you find fault with someone, release this same gift of forgiveness to them. A couple more verses. You guys still hanging in there with me? All right. This is the word of God, man. I know some of you guys are falling asleep. I, I already got the law of seven. Some of you are like, oh, he's, all he's doing is reading the Bible today. Um, some days we need that. That's right. That's right. 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. 
It says, for love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Love becomes the mark of true maturity. You know somebody knows Jesus when they love people. I can think of the most influential people in this church, and I know that they know Jesus because they love people. The light of Christ is on them. They don't judge people. They, they, they don't push people away. They love people. They don't judge them on their outer appearance. They're not here. You know what I don't like about Los Angeles? I'm going to tell you guys. Whew. One of the things that I don't like is how transactional it is. It's a transactional city. Everybody's trying to meet somebody who knows somebody who can connect somebody. And uh, it's, there's a level of superficiality and shallowness that takes place in a lot of the relationships. And I want to tell you now, that is not the kind of relationships that I want being developed in this church. I don't want that transactional love. I don't want those transactional relationships. Um, you know, who do you know? What set do you work on? What director or producer are you related to? You know, I just, it drives me crazy. I'm not from that culture and to come into this culture, it, it irks me. Because you could be having a conversation with somebody and they're looking over their shoulder trying to get the attention of somebody who might get them on, you know? And it's like, I'm right here. Like, keep, like, let's, let's, let's connect. And it makes it super hard to do so. But what that tells me is that they lack maturity, that their intentions are most likely in the wrong place, and they haven't truly understood what it means to be present and to be love. Three more verses, 15. And let the body... No, wait, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let your heart be always guided by the peace of the anointed one. That's Jesus who called you to peace as part of his one body and always be thankful. One of the most influential practices that completely changed my life was the practice of gratitude. Does anybody here do daily gratitude practice or daily thankfulness practice? In the morning, I get up at 4 a.m., and uh, I, I head downstairs and I get on my knees and I thank God for everything that I have. And that's the roof over my head, the clothes on my back, the food in my fridge, the transportation, the health of my loved ones, uh, and, and, and really the fact that I woke up. I start with a simple practice of gratitude. Everything I do is with thankfulness and with a form of gratitude. And I would encourage you guys to do the same. Always be thankful. Because what I've realized is that there's somebody praying to be in your position somewhere in this world. And most of us overlook that fact. I believe there's a statistic that goes to say that uh, as Americans, I think that we are, uh, we're, we're richer than, what is it, 95% of the world? 97% of the world? And we take that for granted. Even broke here is well off in a lot of other places than in a lot of other places. And not to say that, oh, America, we're the best. Like, we have our issues. We got a lot of problems and it seems like we keep going down further and further. I'm not going to get political. All I'm saying is that we have a lot to be thankful for. If you woke up this morning, you got something to be grateful for. If you've got a pulse, then you got a purpose and God's not done with you. Verse 16. Yeah. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This says, let the word of Christ live in you richly. I want to say this. How do you let the word of God live in you if you ain't willing to open it and read it? It doesn't just magically appear there. And so here I am encouraging you guys to do what? Read your Bible. Read your pastors always were talking about read your Bible. Why? Don't rely on my Bible understanding for your guys' edification, right? Because what I eat isn't going to make you full, if that makes sense. I was going to say something else, but the, the, the Lord got a hold of me and said, hey, let's see. I need to back to verse 12. I need to check my heart. But he goes on to say, apply the scriptures as you teach and instruct one another with the Psalms and with the festive praises and with prophetic songs given to you spontaneously by the spirit. So sing to God with all your hearts. And we're going to get a chance to do that in just a moment. We're going to get a chance to worship together and to praise God together and to step into a moment of being able to glorify the creator of all things. But I, I say this often that the devil knows the Bible better than a lot of Christians. Get into your word, start to understand it, write it on your heart. How can you fight a battle? This is called the sword of the spirit, right? The sword of the spirit. How can you go to war if you don't have a weapon? Most of you are showing up empty handed 
talking about the devil's whooping you. I know why, because you don't even know what to stand on. You're listening to lies. You're listening to all kinds of false accusations about who you are. You don't even know who you are because you refuse to open this word. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. This last verse says, let every activity of your lives and every word that comes from your lips be drenched with the beauty of our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, even when you're playing basketball. And bring your constant praise to God the Father because of what Christ has done for you. The question is, is what has God done for you? I want to live a life that looks like Jesus. I want to live a life that impacts others. I want the words and the deeds of my life to be better and to do better. And I want to make an impact in people in my oikos, in my sphere of influence. Amen? The word of God is our lifeline. It has so much wisdom. It has so much knowledge. It has all of the answers to all of your questions. And I want to encourage you guys to get into your scripture. Amen? Worship, would you guys come up? Listen, you guys, um, I believe in the vision that God gave me for this church. I truly do. I believe it with all my heart. I believe that he has brought the right people at the right time for a time such as this. I believe that where God is taking us, we're going with or without a lot of people. You might not see it, but I believe it. I believe that God's put the right people in this room. The right people in this room. It's not an accident. I don't believe that it's a coincidence. You might be here for the first time. Maybe the last time after what you heard what we're about to do, and, and that's okay. God bless you. I love you, and I wish you the best. But we cry out often that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. The Bible says the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. There are people out there who do not know Jesus. There are people out there struggling. You might even be in here struggling wrestling with the things that you're going through, not knowing the peace that you have, not knowing the freedom that you have, not knowing that you've been set free. My cry on a regular basis is, Lord, send laborers. The Bible says, pray to the God of the harvest that he would send laborers. And so my cry on a regular basis, when I'm on my knees, after I give my gratitude and thanks, I say, Lord, send laborers. You've given us this vision to take over this city for the name of Jesus, to be a life-giving church. God, send laborers. I can't do this on my own. My wife and I can't do this on my own. And every month, after month, after month, after month, God has been faithful and has given us new leaders, new people to step up, new worship. Like it's, it's continued to grow. It's continued to blow my mind. Continue to blow my mind. But I, I believe this can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. This cannot be done by my strength. The Bible says uh, that, that Apollos planted and Paul watered or vice versa, but God brought the increase. God did the growing. So, so we can do the work, we can do the announcements, we can set up the opportunities, but only God's going to grow it. So it's by the power of God. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of Jesus. I believe that right now the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of some of your hearts, right? I, I, I truly do. Some of you are here and you're like, man, I'm here. I feel the vision. I see the vision. I see the dream. And I believe I can be a part of that. And I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to partner with Royal City Church in building this vision out and seeing this dream come to fruition. Would you guys stand with me real quick? The Holy Spirit is knocking at the door of your heart. And my question for you today is, will you let him in? Will you let him work in you? Will you let him live in you? We're going to sing a worship song in just a moment, welcoming in the Holy Spirit. But what, would he do, what do we do when we welcome somebody in? If you were to welcome somebody into your home, what would you do? You say, come in, come on in. Come on in, take off your shoes, kick up your feet, come on in. And so right now, I want to give you guys an opportunity to do the exact same thing. Would you guys with me say, come in, come in. Would you invite the Holy Spirit to come into your heart? Holy Spirit, come in. Say with me, come in. Just say, come in. Two words, come in, come in. Again, come in, say it with your chest, come in. 
Come in. When we ask, we will receive. When we seek, we will find. When we knock, the door will be open. And so right now in this moment, if you're saying, Holy Spirit, come in, he will come into your life. He will come into your being. He will come into your situation. He will come into your problem. You only have to invite him in. The vision that I have can only be accomplished by Holy Spirit filled believers. And I believe that you're in the room today. So say it one more time with me. Come in. Amen. Holy Spirit, come in. Amen. You guys, he's here and he hears you. He's listening. He has your attention. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church in preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.